Okay, now I have one question from the last session. The question is, if God knows our need, why do we need to pray? I have answered that question once before already. The Father knew what we need before we ask Him. Now, it doesn't mean we don't pray, but when He knows our need, we know that He cares about us. He pays attention to us. He knows our need. So we can ask with confidence. The first, first motivation to pray is that I can pray with confidence. Second is, uh, He knows our needs. Sometimes even before we ask, He prepares for th things that we never imagined. That's what uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 says, that the eyes have not seen, the heart has not heard of, have not thought of the things that He prepared for those who love Him. So He can still prepare things for us that we never imagined. We, in our prayer, the main purpose is not to ask. One purpose is to ask. The main purpose of prayer is to build up the relationship with God, that we have a connection with God, that we love God and He His love comes to us and we follow Him, we obey Him, and then He is pleased with us and He'll bless our whole life. Actually, the Bible says you seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will come to us. So it's not seeking our own thing. When we seek God's thing, He will answer our prayer. So I hope that we don't have to uh, think about uh, why uh, we, uh, we need to pray if He knows our need already. Now we still still pray for our needs, but for myself, I don't spend much time praying for myself. I just pray for openings. Lord, open more ways so that I can bless more people. When God sees my heart, He will give me more. Another example is Solomon. When he asked for wisdom, God gave him more than he asked for. So when we have God's heart, He will give us what, uh, what we need to in order to enter God's plan. So the prayer of uh, the purpose of prayer is not to inform God of what we need. We're not to inform Him of everything we need. We just build up the relationship with God and then God will respond to our needs. But we still pray. We pray for, we pray for the people around us. We pray for the church. We pray for the country. We pray for everyone. And we pray for God's kingdom to come and bless everyone. So we want to pray. But then we pray with the motivation of connecting with God. The purpose of prayer is mainly to connect with God so that He can connect to us and bless us uh, according to His will. So the main purpose of prayer is not to inform God of what we need, but to be connected with God, to build up the relationship with God. Okay, now we go to the next question. Motivate people to read the Bible. How can we use these Bible verses to encourage people to read the Bible? And I hope... Um, now this, again, I said this is a uh, classwork that we uh, use this to, you know, this is what you do. And then if you uh, do all this, uh, first it will help you in your ministry because then you'll be able to use this teaching. If you don't practice, you won't be able to learn this teaching. This teaching is not common. I haven't seen... Uh, now I've seen, I know uh, there is a teaching called Father's Heart, but still there is a, uh, a difference between us. The Father's Heart is a ministry talking about the heart of God. Uh, I think, you know, uh, I thank God that He has given me ideas to teach, and I found that it's based on Scripture. I thank God that He has given me the opportunity to study uh, so much exegetical theology that is to analyze the Bible so that my teachings came from the Bible and I show from the Bible why I have this uh, uh, teaching of interactive prayer how we can believe in God's grace it's not my invention it's God's ideas uh, and the motivation by grace instead of by the law I haven't found many people motivating this kind of teaching and I uh, and I hope that you all learn it well I hope you'll learn it well so that you can apply it so that you'll be motivated and that your people will be mo motivated and be used by God. Okay? How to motivate people to read the Bible with these verses? 2 Timothy 2.13 If 
we are faithless, he remains faithful, he cannot deny himself. So here it says that even when we are faithless, even when we are not faithful, he is still faithful and he, because he cannot deny himself, he cannot deny his promises, he will act according to his promises, he will keep his promises. So we read the Bible because it contains many, many promises of God. It tells us for sure what God will do when we trust in him and obey him and love him. The Bible already tells us. So we will have confidence in God. When we, the more we read the Bible, the more confidence we have in God. I have the confidence in God because I, I know many Bible verses and this Bible verse I know for sure will come true. And so I just follow these Bible verses. Okay, number two, verse two. Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So here is that it tells us that the word of God is a lamp to my feet to guide me. We don't know the future. I don't know the future. Actually, uh, when I first became a Christian, God already put in my heart a heart to serve God. And then later, God opened a way for me to be able to go overseas to study, to get a, uh, three degrees. Uh, that it's God's preparation for me. It's just something I did not know. But God opens the way. God guides my steps. God will guide your steps too. So when we have the Word of God, the Word of God will guide us. And when we obey God's Word, He will guide us more to go higher and higher. So I hope that you all will uh, follow God's way and that's the best way. Now I want to tell you a little story uh, that shows that God has a wonderful plan in my life and my motivation is to encourage you when you follow God and love God He will have His plan in your life before I was born my grandmother had a dream a few days before I was born she said that she saw a man in white appear to her and then she told my father and my father told me so um, now this could be a sign that God already chose me. Now God chose me, that's a fact. But that He showed my family member that He chose me, that there is a special plan in my life. And I hope you all believe that you all have a special plan too. It's not just pastors. Everyone who loves God and obey God will have a wonderful plan that God has for us. And then when we read the Bible, we'll enter the plan. We read the Bible, we enter the plan. We don't read the Bible, we cannot enter the plan because we don't know God's heart and God's teachings. Hebrews 4.12 For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So here it says that the word of God can pierce our soul and go deep in our heart to discern what is in us. Now, when God discerns the sin in us, it will help us to go higher. It will help us to obey God. And then when it pierces our heart to show us God's work in our heart, God's heart uh, of using us, God's heart of raising up to a high level, that our life is important, that we follow that, then our life will go higher. So. The Holy Spirit works with the Word of God. The Holy Spirit works with the Word of God to pierce our soul, to lead us, to guide us, to enter God's plan. So the Word of God has this power to pierce our soul. So we ho I hope that we all like the Word of God and, uh, and read the Bible and apply the Bible so that we are guided by the Word of God to follow God. And then 2 Timothy 3.16 All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So here it says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for teaching. Uh, tell us you know, the doctrines of God. And then for reproof, to point out our sins, for correction, to correct us from wrong path to the right path, for instruction in righteousness and teach us what to do to follow God, what is the righteous way, so that the man of God may be complete, that we are complete in God, thoroughly equipped for every good work, so that we can be equipped 
In order to be able to serve God, we need the Word of God. Many pastors, when they preach, I noticed, they just talk about the verse for a few seconds, a few minutes, and then he will jump to some other things. They don't spend time to analyze the Bible. We want to analyze the Bible and divide the Word of God so that people understand what is in the Word of God and apply it to their life. And that way, that uh, first it will benefit the speaker and it will benefit everyone. So this Bible verse tells us that it's important. The teaching, the Word of God would teach us what to do, how to change our path and follow God so that we're equipped for every good work. So if anyone wants to serve God well, he needs the Word of God. And also when he teaches, he needs to talk about God's Word. It's not just talk about experience. We, want, if we can talk about experience, but we want to put more emphasis on God's Word and talk more about God's grace, His, His blessings, what He has done for us, His love for us, His wonderful plan for us, so that people will hunger for God. So this hopefully will motivate people to read the Word of God so that we have all these promises in our heart. So remember all this, I, that I always remember, that when I love God, God will prepare for things that I, my heart has never thought of. So I know that He will prepare pleasant surprises for me. I remember these promises. I remember that, that He says that when I delight in Him, that He will make me ride on high, in the high place, uh, in a high place of the earth that I will go higher and higher. So I hope that we all are motivated. Okay, here motivation to live a holy life, to avoid sin and to obey God. How do we motivate people to live a holy life with these verses? Galatians 6, 8 For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap destruction, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. So this verse tells us that we have two ways to go in our life. We either sow to our flesh, follow our flesh, and then we'll have destruction. Or we follow the Holy Spirit, and then we'll have eternal life and all kinds of blessings. So which way do you want to go? So we want to use this verse to encourage people. When you follow the Holy Spirit and, and uh, live a life of holiness, you have everlasting life and you will everything will be given to you. Your life will go higher and higher. But if we live in sin, we'll reap destruction. Destruction of the family, of the, of the future, of uh, our supplies, of the church. Uh, everything we have can be destroyed by Satan. So we know, you know, I hope we all realize that sins are terrible. Sins are ways that let Satan attack us to steal and kill and destroy our life. So we don't want to give Satan a chance. We want to follow uh, uh, the Holy Spirit. Now many people say it's hard to not to uh, follow the flesh. We need to remind ourselves it's destructive. It's destructive. Anytime I sin, it's destructive. And then when, anytime I obey God, God is very happy. Second Timothy 2.20 But in, great, in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. So here it says that, that in a, a great house, there will be vessels of gold and silver and also of wood and clay. And some are vessels of honor and some are vessels of dishonor. And then if we, cleanse us, if we cleanse ourselves, if we live a holy life, if we say no to sins and are sorry for our sins. Many people talk about repentance. We don't just repent. We want to hate sin and turn away from sin. We don't want any part of sin. We want to live in holiness. And then if we cleanse ourselves, holiness also means a close relationship with God. First, close relationship with God. Dedication to God and then obedience to God. So if we cleanse ourselves from the dishonor, then we'll be a vessel of honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. So if we live a holy life, we are prepared for every good work and the master is happy with us and we are, we are prepared to go higher in our life. Matthew 7, 21, this verse talk about that uh, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. 
And many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So we want to first motivate with grace. With grace here is that if we obey God, even a cup of cold water, God is very happy. And God will give us provision and wisdom and opportunity to serve God. But when people serve God, even when they uh, prophesied, cast out demons, and done many wonders, if they live a sinful life, if they don't obey God and they don't love God, then what happens is, Jesus said, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, that you who practice uh, follow sins, then uh, depart from me. So even when people serve God, but if they live in sin, they will not inherit eternal life. You know, there are pastors who steal money. There are Christians who steal money. It's terrible because if we do that and don't repent and just think of, I'll get money from God and God will understand that. <clears throat> if we want to do that, we have to ask the permission of the church to give us more salary. If the church does not agree to that, if we take from the church offering, that is stealing. And it's a waste of time to serve God if we are stealing. So I hope that we all understand that if pastors live a sinful life, have adultery, or uh, abuse people, tell lies, hurt people, it, then the ministry is all waste. The whole life is waste. So I hope we understand that holiness is very, very important. Now this is a warning. This is a warning here in Matthew 7, 21. It's a warning to warn people to obey God. If not, there can be serious punishment. Okay, and then E, the next point is motivate people to take care of problems in our lives. So how to mo motivate people? Now, in this last few uh, points here, we talk about motivate people to, to love God, to uh, to read the Bible, to uh, live a life of holiness, uh, and to pray. All these are what pastors need to do. We need to motivate people to love God and to follow God happily, joyfully. So it's very important to remember this and use the grace of God to motivate people. The grace of God uh, will give us motivation and strength and, and reward in our whole lifetime. James 1.19, here, the motivation to take care of problems in our life. So then, my beloved, beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Now, uh, here it talks, it talks about everyone be swift to hear, quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath, slow to be angry. Because the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Now this part here, the wrath of God, ma wrath of man does not produce. The uh, the wrath of of man does not produce the righteousness of God. This is a a warning. But even when we give the law, the warning, we want to give people the grace of God first. So even the Bible verse doesn't have the grace of God. We want to introduce the grace of God first. So we want to say something like this. When we have gentleness, when we have love for people, then it will promote the righteousness of God. And God is very happy. And God's life in us will produce the fruit of righteousness, of love and joy and peace. And this will affect people. But then if people don't take care of problems in their life. So the, uh, the theme here is to take care of the problems in their life. If they don't take care of the problems in their life, then they will, uh, what happens is their life, when they, are, they live in anger, it doesn't produce the righteousness of God. It doesn't produce good result. But it produces, uh, give Satan an opportunity to destroy our life. So we want to be able to quick to listen to people and listen to God and slow to speak. Don't talk so much except when we're teaching we have to speak but when we listen to people we listen more and then slow to wrath. 
uh, that we don't get angry easily. That even when we have anger, we want to take care of it first before we, we talk with people. So when we live like this, then our life will produce righteousness. If not, the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. There are people who have anger and then what happens is it can destroy their life, their family and uh, and uh, ministry. Okay, now, motivate people to serve God. Now, many pastors like to uh, know how to do it and do it better. So here, how to use these Bible verses to motivate people to serve God. First, my definition of serving God is not just taking a position of ministry in a church. Serving God can be anything that we glorify God and bless people. It can be that we are full of joy and we witness to people about Jesus. Tell people how Jesus, how He is wonderful, how He has blessed us, how He is willing to bless you. Uh, that is also already ministry. That we care about people, we meet their needs, listen to them and help them to understand the love of God. That's already ministry. We share about God's work as ministry. Uh, and uh, it can be praising God when we praise freely that's ministry so everything we do to glorify God and bless people that's that's ministry now the main ministry should be related to the Great Commission to preach the gospel to the whole world and then to teach people to obey everything Jesus has taught us so it's both evangelism and sanctification to help people to grow spiritually Okay, Mark 9.41 For whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name because you belong to Christ, assuredly I say to you, you, he will by no means lose his reward. Now Matthew has this similar verse, but here it tells you, uh, because in Matthew it says that because the name of disciple. So what does it mean we are disciple or the one who received the water is the disciple? Now here it says that Whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name because you belong to Christ. So if someone gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ, then he will by no means lose his reward. So here, this verse is mainly talking about doing to Christians. But we can be doing to non-Christians to help them to believe in Jesus. We can give water or food or something else to non-Christians and help them to believe in Jesus. Uh, now when we... Uh, you know, do world relief and help people in needs. Uh, and at the same time, we glorify God. We uh, tell them we are Christians and so we do this and we want you to know about Jesus. That's, that's also fulfilling this, uh, uh, this Bible verse. So this Bible verse tells us that if we do to one of these uh, little ones of Jesus, that because they belong to Jesus or we want to bring them to Jesus, that we will by no means lose this reward. So any, anything we do for God in His name. In His name means that we do it because we are Christian. We also let people know that we are Christian. That's, therefore, I want to do this to bless you. Uh, we don't have to say it, I do it because I, I'm a Christian. We can say, Jesus loves you. Jesus cares about you. I want to bring the blessings of Jesus to you. That already is saying we are doing it in Jesus' name. So if we do a little ministry to someone, God already reward us. So if we do more to help people spiritually, God will reward us more. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28 Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, and for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So how do you use this verse to motivate people? First, you know, when we come to Jesus, when we're heavy laden, come to Jesus, He'll give us rest. But he, here He talks about second kind of rest. When we take His yoke, that means the yoke is what is put on the shoulder of a, an ox to pull a plow, to plow the land. So to take Jesus' yoke means to serve God together with Jesus. Take His yoke upon us and learn from Him, learn from His lifestyle. And for because he is gentle and lowly, learn his gentleness and his humility, and then we'll find rest for your soul. So when we serve God, we take Jesus' yoke and learn from Jesus. We'll have more relaxation in our soul. Our whole soul will be relaxed, and we'll find rest in our souls. So this is a deeper rest than the first rest up here. In verse twenty-eight, that's the first kind of rest. 
The second kind of rest is when we take Jesus' yoke and learn from Jesus. So we want to do what Jesus tells us to do and learn from His lifestyle. And then we'll find a greater joy and a greater freedom in Jesus. So do you want this greater freedom? And Jesus will remember everything you do and He'll bless your whole life. Your life will be full of joy and peace and strength. Okay, another verse to motivate people to serve God. John 12, 26. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my Father will honor. So if anyone serves Jesus, let him follow Jesus, have a close relationship with Jesus. And where he just, Jesus is, there my servant, those who serve him, will also be. And then if anyone serves Jesus, him my Father will honor. So God will honor those who serve him. When God honors you, God respects you, God will bless your whole life and raise you up to a high level. So that's the best we, it can happen because for us, we have no guarantee that our life will go higher. Some people, they say, I, you know, when I work in the world, I earn more money. Now, there is no guarantee that you can earn money either. But even if you earn money, it doesn't mean your life is going higher. But if we have God's blessing, God's honor, God's honor on us, He will raise us higher. And I thank God that these teachings came from God to me. And, and it, many people said they are really helped by these teachings. And I thank God for that. It's not for me. So I give honor to God. That's God honoring me. So I'm saying to you, if you follow this teaching and follow the Bible, then God will bless your whole lifetime and your whole life and you'll be used by God. So that's the best thing that can happen to you. So that's how we can motivate people to serve God. Okay, another verse. This is a warning of people who don't want to serve God. Matthew 25, 30. So cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. That is the wicked and lazy servant. He will be cast into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And in 41, then the, the, to the goats, who did not do it to the, uh, the little brothers of Jesus. Then he will say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. So this is warning. So the, lazy, the wicked and lazy servant will be thrown into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Bible talks about the future, there's only heaven and hell. There's no third place. Some people say there's a third place, it's called the uh, place of whipping and gnashing of teeth. There's no such place. When we go to heaven, we'll be joyful. When people go to hell, they will be whipping and gnashing of teeth. So this is hell. Now, we're not saved by serving God. We're saved by repentance and trusting in Jesus as our Savior. But when we trust in Jesus as our Savior, Jesus lives in us. And then we have eternal life, we have a new life. When we have this new life, this new life want to bless people, want to serve God, want to help people to believe in Jesus, want to glorify God. So any real Christian will want to glorify God. If a Christian has no desire to do that, he never tell anyone about Jesus, the people around him will go to hell one day and he doesn't care, he doesn't tell them about Jesus. That means there is something wrong with the faith and this person can lose salvation because he did not really believe in Jesus. When we really believe in Jesus, Jesus will live in us. So believe in Jesus is not just a belief in the head. It's a relationship. When we believe in Jesus, we have a relationship with Jesus and Jesus will speak to our heart to tell us to change our life, to repent and obey Him. And then when we obey, then we respond to God. Then there is an interaction with God. Then there is, this is a real question. And the real question we want to glorify God. So, so uh, be very sure to tell people. Every, you notice every time I talk about uh, good works, I always tell people we are not saved by good works. We are saved by grace through faith. But faith will always produce good works. And then when people have this life of God, it's a relationship with God, He lives in us, then we'll bear fruit. We'll want to bless people, want to help people. So this is how I explain uh, serving God and and then God will bless us but if we don't if people don't that means there's something wrong with the faith and they can lose salvation and that's terrible okay now um, 
Let me ask you, is it time already? Uh, please answer me right away. Is it time already for lunch in Kenya? Uh, please answer. If it's not ready, okay, uh, then I'll stop now, okay? So we'll come back. Now, before you come back 10 minutes, before you come back, please let me know. Okay, God bless you all, and I pray for God's blessing so that you motivate people with God's grace. So today, I go through the questions. The purpose is so that we understand it, we remember it. Because just hearing once doesn't guarantee that we learn it. And if you still preach the law only, you're not learning this. And so I hope you learn this motivation by grace. That we are motivated by grace. That God loves us, God cares about us. And when we trust in Him, when we have a good relationship with Him, when we love Him, He's very happy. And He is happy to bless us. When we respond to Him and obey Him, He'll use us greatly to bless other people. So I hope that you'll grow in Jesus and learn how to help people. Going through the questions, why I want to explain again why I go through these questions. Because uh, these are concepts many people may not have. And uh, it's very important that we learn this and be able to apply it in our teaching. Uh, some people, they learn this and then they show me the teaching. And then I said, you haven't learned it yet. You haven't talked about God's grace yet. You still talk about what people do, what people do. Now, we do talk about what people do, but we don't start with what people do. We start with God's grace and His love, His work, what He's doing to help us before we go to any idea. That way, we see that God is in control of everything. We just fit into His plan and then we're okay. So in order to help us all to be able to apply this to our teaching, that's my purpose. It's not just for the people to hear the lecture, hear the message, and then they, and that's it. No, you need to practice it. So only those who can submit to me that you can answer these questions, at least uh, part of them that you at least answer part of them to show me that you understand how to motivate people by grace uh, to, obey, to obey the Word of God. And then I will, I will see. And then also write, uh, you can write sermons. And then I will, I will see or let Washington see first uh, because some of you might not be able to send it to me. And then you see it and then see if the person is, is understanding First, talking about God's grace, His plan, His wonderful things, His wonderful work before we talk about the responsibility of people and how we can have strength from God to fulfill our responsibilities. Because all the ministry belongs to God. All the ministry belongs to God. It's God who does the ministry. So we need to just fit into God's plan. Okay, now what we're going to talk about here is enter God's perfect plan for our lives. So this is the third part of the teaching. So according to Psalm 139, 16 to 17, how is God's plan for us? Now the verse I did not put down here, it's that before one of the days of my life came to be, my life is already written in your book. And then how precious are your thoughts, O Lord, that, that God already has His wonderful plan and His thoughts are full of uh, you know, his plan is full of precious thoughts. So how's God's plan for us? God's plan was made ahead of time. It was made ahead of time for us. Secondly, it was wonderful plan. They are precious thoughts. And also God can make the plan come true. If we follow him, love him, obey him, and serve him, the plan will come true. And when the plan will come true, our whole life is blessed. So everything I talk about God's first God loves us. God cares about each individual. He has a plan. And this plan is wonderful. And this plan is workable. He will make sure it comes true when we trust in Him and obey Him. And then wonderful things will happen to our life. And so from this God's plan, what nature do we see? We see God's His ability to plan, His care for people, His ability to um, of administration to be able to apply what He plans to our life. 
and He would tenderly lead us to enter God's plan. So He's very patient, even though ma uh, many times we did not obey Him. He still patiently lead us. So when we understand that, then we'll say, don't worry. Uh, for instance, when I have any problem, I'll say, God has a plan, no problem. Uh, it will, uh, God's plan will come true. I just obey Him. Everything will be okay. Okay, number two question. Do people enter God's plan automatically? How do we enter God's plan? Romans 12, 1 to 2. I did not put down the Bible verse here. That Bible verse is that we dedicate our whole life as a living, body, a living sacrifice and then uh, uh, not, do not conform to the world but be transformed by the renewal of our mind. Then we can discern the good and perfect and pleasing will of God. So what it says is that in order to enter God's plan, to discern His plan, first we dedicate our whole life, offer our body as a living sacrifice. When we offer our body as a living sacrifice, many sacrifice, many people do not want to offer their life to God. They said, if I offer my life to God, I have nothing left. Then God will not treat me nicely. nicely then, but if I follow my way, I can earn more money. But actually, we have no guarantee. But if we follow God, God will provide what we need. So we don't need to worry. God's plan is the best. Because many people don't believe God's plan is the best. Many people believe their own plan is the best. But we are human. How can we have a wonderful plan? But when we dedicate our body as a living sacrifice and do not be conformed to the world, do not follow the way of the world, to follow money and chase after women or men uh, or get reputation or get power and then be renewed in our mind by God. Then we can start to discern God's wonderful plan and then gradually when we obey Him, we can enter God's plan. And His plan is the best. One day many people go to heaven and say, I didn't know God has such a wonderful plan. I did not enter the plan. It's my loss. So I hope we all enter God's plan. We just have a good relationship with Him, trust Him, obey Him, serve Him, then gradually we'll enter a better and better plan. Now, serving Him doesn't mean everyone is a minister. You can be doing different kind of work, but still you glorify God when, whenever we can, then you are serving God. Number three, please explain the concept of plan A, B, C, D based on Romans 12, 1 to 2. Now, this any concept I have is, is based on Scripture. I cannot make up my own plan, my own ideas. <clears throat> in, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> in Romans 12, 1 to 2, it talks about when a person dedicates life to God, offers his body as living sacrifice and do not be conformed to the world and tr be tr renewed of, uh, by the trans uh, renewal of the mind, then they will enter the plan. So when we dedicate our life to God, then we'll enter a plan. That means when people don't offer the body of a sacrifice, when they follow the world, when they don't, their life is not transformed by the renewal of the mind, then they cannot enter the best plan. The best plan God wrote for us is the best thing that can happen to us. But many people did not think of it, so they missed that. But if we follow it, then we can obey God's plan. Now, in the Bible, we can see different people. They f Some people follow God's plan. For instance, we see Joseph, Moses, uh, Samuel, David. Now, David failed in one point when he sinned. Of course, he has failed more than one point. Every one of us has failed in more than one point. Uh, so, when people obey God, then they serve God more. They, they follow God more. And in the Bible, also, there are people... Of, who have failed in many ways, in a number of ways, like uh, uh, Samson, Samson, the, the one who was very strong, and uh, his life could have been better if he did not fall into the traps of women. So he did not go into the perfect plan, but he still go into a level of the plan. So we, if someone follows God totally, when he first believed in Jesus, he'll be in plan A. If he sin or are weak in some way, go to plan B, C, and D. If he repent and turn back to God and obey God, it will go back up. But it's not easy to go back to plan A. The reason is, 
It's not that God doesn't want us. It's because sometimes we lose the time. Sometimes we lose the reputation. Sometimes we lose faith when we have sinned, when, that we don't have a peace of mind. So whatever it is that we sin, uh, that we did not follow God, it can take away from this perfect plan. So the more, the closer we are to God, then the closer we are to plan A. I hope we all can enter as close as possible to plan A. Everyone can enter plan A if we totally dedicate our life to God. Uh, if we dedicate our life to God early, if you wait until you're 80 years old, it's hard to follow the perfect plan of God because you have lost a lot of time already. Okay, question number four. According to Isaiah 58, 14, when we delight in God, what will, uh, what will He do for us? That He will make us ride to the high place of the earth that will, will go higher and higher. So when we delight in God, we'll enter this higher plan of God. This plan was already written. It's, it's already there for us. It's just whether we enter or not. It's all planned for us. Number five, what happens when people follow or don't follow God's perfect plan? Now, I want to first talk about who don't follow God's plan. Now, some people, they, they, ask, me, they ask me, they say, how come I believe in Jesus? And in my family, there's fights. There are fights and maybe there are divorce. My children don't listen to me and I'm unhappy. I have emotional problem and the church has all kind of problem. And I have problem in the church. I have problem with uh, friends. I have problem in jobs. Now these people, some people have problems in every area of their life. The point is, where, where do these problems come from? Do these problems come from God's planning? God doesn't plan terrible things for us. God planned the best. The reason is people don't follow God's plan. They don't have, they don't have a close relationship with God. They don't put down the burdens, their worries, uh, their negative thinking, negative emotions, and the sins, and they just follow the flesh. That way they will not be connected to God. They're close to God. Then God's blessing will not come to them, and then they will have problems. So the whole life will have problems. But when people follow God's perfect plan, that's guarantee life will go better and better. Now, better and better doesn't necessarily mean rich, but there will be sufficient for us that our life can go higher and higher. So the perfect plan means that our life will go in a perfect path that we can bless more and more people. We ourselves are blessed. So I hope we all would hunger for this perfect plan of God. Okay, and then the fourth uh, lesson do not let anyone destroy God's plan for us. Now, many people are affected by people and uh, because people around us have sins and we have sins too. So everyone has sins and so we are affected by people. So these are some questions. Why do many people have the tendency of being critical with people and hurting people easily? So we first we need to understand human nature. The Bible said all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So everyone has sinned. That's why people get angry with people and are critical and they like to compare, like to hurt people, like, like to take advantage of people. That's human nature. Even among Christians, do all Christians really love to bless people? Some people say they want to, but the action is not doing that. But if we really love God and say, if I love God and love people, that's the best that can happen to me. When I love people and love God, then God sees that my heart and He will bless me and my life will go higher and higher. That way, they will they would uh, be willing to take care of the problems in their life and not to let anger or frustration or criticism affect their life. I'm one person who really wants to take care of my life so that my life is not affected by any kind of sin, that my life is going higher and higher up. I just want to bless people without condition. I just want to help people without condition of expectation or paying back. I just want to bless people. And God bless me so much, I don't look for anyone to pay me back. I do it all for free and I do it happily. So uh, I want to get rid of this tendency to hurt people and criticism. I want to be positive, neck up positive, joyful, and full of love. And I hope you all hunger for that. Now, at the same time, there are people, many people who 
or have a tendency to hurt people and criticize people, then we accept they are like that. When they are like that, we don't have to be affected by them because they are sinners. I want to bless them, but they are sinners. So they have no choice but to hurt people. Many people, they always follow the sinful nature. They have no choice but to hurt people, always hurting people. So we understand that people do hurt people, so we don't take them seriously. But we care about them, we love them. Number two, when Joseph was sold by his brothers, humanly speaking, have his brothers taken many things away from him? Now, it seems that humanly speaking, so I put down here, humanly speaking, Yes, humanly speaking, they have taken, taken many things from him because he had the favor of his father, that he was treated nicely by his father. And so immediately he was sold as a slave and he has to work very hard. So immediately, humanly speaking, his brothers took many things away from him. But on the long term, he got all of the things back and even more because in Egypt, finally he became the prime minister and then he has everything more than before. So his brothers really did not take away anything. It's only in the beginning, but later he got everything back. According to Genesis 39 2, the Lord was with Joseph's, Joseph so that he prospered. So how was Joseph's relationship with God when, when he was sold to Egypt? Was he affected by his brothers selling him to Egypt? So his brothers sold him to Egypt. But then the Bible verse uh, Genesis 39 2 says the Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered now he was very difficult because he did not know the language of the Egyptians he has to learn the language and but he did not complain to God now, he might have complained a little bit and then after a while he repented now this is only a possibility I think humanly speaking he would have complained he would have been in fear he would have been in worry but immediately when he come close to God, God might have spoken to him, guided him and tell him, don't worry, I have a wonderful plan in your life. Just follow my way. I will take care of you. So he must have a good relationship with God that the Lord was with Joseph. Because the Bible doesn't talk about someone who rejects God, who criticizes God and blames God, and God will feel him strongly. The Bible doesn't talk about that. The Bible only talks about people who love God. And then God blessing is on him God's presence is on him now God's presence is on everyone but many people reject him so God's presence doesn't bring blessing and doesn't bring change of life but for Joseph his presence the presence of God was strong upon him because he has this continual relationship so it was his continual relationship that he took care of the problem of his brothers so this session here is about don't let anyone destroy God's plan for us because if we get frustrated or angry because of people then we lose these blessings but if we say doesn't matter what they do cannot take away God's blessing now that's very important I have been hurt by people before and I have to say I have hurt people too sometimes unknowingly sometimes knowingly in the past but now I choose to really always blessing people and never have a thought not to bless people so and then when people are not nice to me, I would just say that is his problem. I don't want to take that into my heart. I don't want that to affect me. I want to trust in God and relax in God and don't be affected by him. So um, he was not affected by his brothers and his relationship was good with God. So that's Joseph, a good example of someone who really follow God. And then what do Genesis 39 to and Genesis 50, 20 say that God did to Joseph when he was sold by his brothers. Now in Genesis 39 2 it talks about that the Lord was with him, with uh, Joseph, and then the Lord prospered him. And then Genesis 50 20 that Joseph, when his brothers came to him later and then his father died. And then Joseph said to his brothers, your intention was to hurt me, but God in God's intention is to bless me and to bless everyone for the benefit of many. So God's, God's plan is to bless many people. So that means when people hurt us, they cannot really hurt us. When we trust in God, when we obey God, they can only hurt themselves. 
But when we follow God, God will bless us and take away all the things that people did to us. It won't affect us. So it will tell us that uh, God will always do wonderful things to us, even when people don't you know, hurt us. And when we trust in God, God will always do wonderful things to us. And then number five, applying Joseph's experience, can people take away God's plan in our lives if we love and obey God? The answer is no. Because when we trust and obey God and love Him and serve Him, then we are precious in the sight of God. We are precious in His plan. He will make sure that we can go higher and higher to bless more people. So nobody can take away God's plan. So we have this guarantee. Nobody can take away God's plan. And then number six, do what people say negatively have authority? Uh, why are so many people affected by negative words? How can we stop being affected by people? So when people say negative words, do these words have authority? It sounds like they have authority. When they yell at us and say, ah, oh, I don't like you, it seems that they have authority. But actually in God's sight, they have no authority. It's only like Satan roaring. Satan has no authority. We have authority when we trust and obey God. But why are so many people affected by negative words? Because people just don't have this biblical concept. The biblical concept is that God's plan cannot be destroyed by sinners. That God is a wonderful plan stored in heaven for us. When we trust in Him and obey Him, dedicate our body as a living sacrifice, then we will enter this plan and nobody can take away the plan. Even when people try to attack us, if we just follow God and, God and obey God, they cannot hurt us. They cannot take away God's plan. But many people are affected by negative people because they don't trust in God. They just look at people with the human eyes. With human eyes, they will say, uh, these people are hurting me, these people are terrible, and then they will get discouraged, and then they would uh, lose strength. So we don't want to look at people with a human perspective. We want to look at people with a biblical perspective. That is what we need to do, biblical perspective. How can we stop being affected by people? We understand that God is in control of everything. We trust in God and obey God, and we choose to forgive, have compassion on people, and forgive them and bless them, and not to be affected affected by that. If they say anything negative, we say, it's okay, no problem. They won't be able to take away my blessings. And then we, uh, then we can stop being affected by them. And then we'll talk about that uh, later in this discussion here. Seven question. Why is it important to clear the garbage from negative words and action of others and ourselves? What can this garbage do to us if we don't clear them? Now, people are not garbage. But the negative words and negative actions are garbage. They are used by Satan. When people roar at other people, they yell at other people and hurt other people and do things to hurt them, this is garbage. But uh, this garbage, and also we have our own garbage. We say, oh, I'm useless. Uh, people are hurting me. I can do nothing. God is not helping me. Now this is garbage. Sometimes people are affected by other people and they are affected by their own negative emotions. So this needs to be cleared. How do we clear this garbage? When, whenever we have any negative thoughts and say, oh, someone doesn't like me, then immediately we have to counteract that with God's word. God likes me when I love God, when I obey God. God likes me. God is pleased with me. God will bless me. Even when people don't like me, it doesn't matter. They cannot take away God's blessing. When someone uh, reject us, it's no problem. I will still bless them, but God re uh, accepts me, God will use me, so I follow God. So just look at God. God is pleased with those who love Him and obey Him. It's very simple, very simple. God is pleased with those who love Him and obey Him. So we love Him and obey Him and serve Him, then nobody can take away anything. So I disregard any negative words. I would, I would uh, handle it. I would say, Okay, these people want to attack us. It's okay. Now, if I have anything wrong, I'll ask for forgiveness. But if I don't have anything wrong and these people attack us, then we'll say it's his problem. I just pray God to help us to forget about it, not to think about it, and just keep praying for him. Keep thinking that you know he has been affected by other people, so he has been hurt, and so he hurt people. So I want to 
bless him, have compassion on him and bless him and forgive him so I can let go of his negative words and action. Okay? Now, if we don't clear this garbage, what will happen? Many people have this problem. They will, they will feel very sad, feel very angry, frustrated. They give up on life. They say, nobody likes me, even God doesn't love me. Now, actually, it came from the garbage, came from the people. People mistreat us doesn't mean God doesn't like us. It's only people who uh, mistreat us. It's not God. So we have to discern. We have to discern the, is the problem is from people. Okay? So how can we clear this garbage? We counteract the garbage with positive words of God. That God loves me. God wants to bless me. God is doing great things in my life. So, um, so we... Uh, uh, so we say, it doesn't matter what he says, it doesn't matter what he did, it won't take away the blessings of God. Now, I have been, some people have tried to cheat me, but I say, okay, they have taken some money from me, but God will give it back to me. It doesn't matter to me, but to him it's terrible. I hope, I pray that he will repent. And I send message to this person, I say, Please come to God in repentance. If you haven't used the money for God and use it for your own purpose, then it's for your destruction. It's very serious. So I advise him uh, peacefully, uh, kindly, to ask him to think about what he has done. And to me, I don't think about that as a loss. I, don't, I haven't lost anything. So we want to clear the garbage and not to keep thinking about the person. Okay, now please describe the five steps to victory. And describe how you use it after someone yells at you angrily. Now these five steps are aware of the problem, aware that I'm affected by people and believe that it's destructive. And what does the Bible say? Tell me to do. And then pray for forgiveness and, and for strength and then choose to obey. So if someone yells at me, First, I'm aware. I'm affected by that person. When a person yelled at me, I would have some uh, hurtful feeling. And then, destructive. I know that is destructive. And then, what does the Bible say? The Bible says that when I'm loved by God, you know, what can people do to me? That I, I, I don't have to worry. If God is for me, no, uh, no one can be against me. What can people do to me? I'm not afraid, so no one can do anything against me. So what, that's what the Bible says. I don't have to worry about what they do and what they say. And then I pray for forgiveness if I have any worry, any doubt, any fear. And also, also pray for strength so that I choose to have compassion on the person. He has been hurt by people. Therefore, he is angry with people. Therefore, he yells at people. So I have compassion and understand him and forgive him and bless him. That way I let go. Now, but some people cannot do it quickly. So I have this point that God gave me. If we improve by 1% a day, what will happen after many days? 100 days, we have 100%. 50 days, we have 50%. If we improve by 1%, 1% is a very little. We just improve a little bit. Today, I can start to praise God. I can start to put down what He said to me. I can stop thinking about what it did to me, I can start to thank God for everything He has done for me, then I'm improving, and very often more than 1%. And then so how can we encourage ourselves with this concept? That we encourage ourselves by saying, I have improved. So it's God's work in me, and I'm obeying God. And so I'm improving, and God is happy, and God is blessing me, and I will go better and better. So whenever we have improved, we always can appreciate ourselves. Now, that is not pride. It's saying, God has worked in my life and I've responded. Thank God for that. Thank God for changing my life. Then <clears throat> I have obeyed God and God will appreciate me and God will remember that I've tried to obey Him. <clears throat> and God will reward me so I can be happy of myself. Hallelujah! But I'm not proud. And I hope everyone is like that. So that's positive attitude. So that's how briefly how to handle of how uh, people sometimes are affected by other people. Now, if you have questions about this, you can send me questions and then I will answer. Send with WhatsApp. Okay, and then fifth lesson, have victory over all sins with God's help. So today I go through the, uh, the main lessons. 
uh, so have victory over all sins with God's help. John 5, 14, Jesus said to the man uh, who was, Jesus healed him of 38 years of sickness. And then Jesus said to him, stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. So here Jesus said, if you sin, something worse will come to you. Now, this is telling us when we repent of our sin, when we ask God to forgive us, it doesn't mean there is no consequence of sin. There are consequences of sin. There is, there are, there is destructiveness of sin. Even when we get the forgiveness of sin. For instance, someone kills someone. He asks God to forgive him. God will forgive him and give him eternal life. He's really sorry. If he's really sorry for God, for, I mean, for his sin and ask God for forgiveness, then God will forgive him and give him eternal life. But he has to go to jail or he might have to face a death sentence. Now, if someone, uh, he has an affair, his wife runs away from him, then now he can ask God for forgiveness, but his family is broken. Even if his wife comes back, there's still a broken relationship, broken hurt feelings that, that could stay in the heart, in the heart of the wife for a long, long time. So any sin, even after forgiveness, still have bad consequences and still have destructiveness. So we need to understand sins have destructiveness. So the questions are, after God forgives us, Will sin bring any kind of damage to our lives? Yes, it will bring damage. It can bring damage to the whole life. Now, some people, they, you know, they, uh, the family, the marriage is broken, the ministry is broken, the trust with people are broken, they have no more friends, they, when they go to church, nobody likes him. So, everything in his life, his work, he, he has no trust, his whole life is broken. So, it can damage his life to the at most. So we need to be very careful not to let sin affect us. Okay, why is there damage after forgiveness? Because sin, now God forgive us is a relationship with God, but still there is a, a the, the sin affect our heart, affect our peace, and affect people's trust of us, affect relationship with people, affect our opportunities of work, of our opportunities in the church, our opportunities in ministry, our opportunities in the future. Like for me, God gives me opportunities to bless many people and I, He has given me many good teachings. I want to guard my life. I don't want anyone to take away, I don't want any sin to take away uh, any good thing from God. So I am very careful to guard my life. And so if I commit a serious sin, I can still have forgiveness and eternal life but it could destroy my ministry and the trust of many people. And also many people will feel very disappointed that they say, well, Pastor, Pastor uh, Yip has failed. Uh, uh, okay, this pastor is calling me. I tell you, uh, I'm, on, I'm online now. I cannot answer the phone. I'm online now. I'm online now. I cannot talk on the phone. I cannot talk on the phone, okay? You have to send me written message. You have to send me written message. I cannot respond on the phone. Okay, number two. Uh, I, I'm sorry, there are still some other questions. Why is there damage after forgiveness? I just answered that. Even after forgiveness of sin, are there consequences of sin? So I said that, yes, there are consequences of sin. Two, when we sincerely repent of our sins, will God surely forgive us? Now, if we sincerely repent of our sin and trust in Jesus as our Savior, He will forgive us. When we have this continual relationship. Now, there are some people like this. They they repent of the sin, they, they're sorry, they try to change, but then they don't have a living relationship with God. They don't have a living relationship with God. Now the thing is, he who has the Holy Spirit has eternal life, that, that he is a child of God. So when we have this relationship with God, some people just say sorry and they try to handle their sin for a little while and then they sin again. And they keep sinning without repenting and without a relationship with God. Without relationship with God, then he cannot have eternal life. The relationship came from relationship with God, trust in Jesus as Savior and the relationship with God. And uh, it's, it doesn't come from changing our lifestyle. It doesn't come from just repenting and changing the lifestyle. It came from 
the relationship with God, trust in Jesus as our Savior. How do we know that He will surely forgive us? It's from the Bible. The Bible promises that when we trust in Jesus, that He will give us eternal life and He will forgive us. So we can be sure of that. And we can tell people, yes, you can, you're forgiven. Now many people doubt and worry about God's forgiveness, but we want to be sure God forgives us. It's a precious gift. It's a precious gift. I have eternal life and I want to treasure that. I want to treasure that. Okay, number three. Galatians 6, 8. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap destruction. What kind of destruction will sowing to the flesh bring? And uh, now, I, again, this is, uh, I have uh, answered this question already, but it's, uh, when we just look at this Bible verse, we'll say, uh, the second part of this verse says that if he sows to the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap uh, eternal life. So God has prepared eternal life for us. But we have our sinful nature. If we follow the sinful nature, then there is destruction. But we always start with God's wonderful plan, God's wonderful grace that we can have eternal life. We have, we have the Holy Spirit. It's only when people don't follow God, don't, you know, they sin and then they can reap destruction. So this destruction can destroy his ministry, his family, his future, his ability, uh, everything. Okay, next question. What will God do if Christians continue to sin? If people continue to sin, uh, it will, His life will go down more and more. It will start from having no peace. Uh, he will start to be angry with himself, angry with other people, angry with God. And the relationship with God will go worse and worse. And he will hear the Holy Spirit less and less. And if he continues sin without repentance, he can one day lose his salvation. So if people, Christians continue sin, it's very serious. First, his whole life, his family, the trust of people will all be destroyed. So people don't trust him. So all this will be destroyed. Ephesians 4.26 In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. According to this verse, how do people give a foothold to the devil. Now this verse is talk about sin. So in your anger, do not sin, do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. So do not stay being angry for a long time and do not give the devil a foothold. So it's talking about, in context, we'll be talking about being angry can give the devil a foothold or other sins can give the devil a foothold. So sinning gives Satan a foothold. We don't want to sin. We don't want to give Satan a foothold. When Satan comes, he will come and destroy and kill and, and steal. He will take away everything we have. So we don't want to, to uh, let him steal. Now, I want to say that many people might have sinful habits. For instance, women might have a sinful, now it's men and women, but I, I'm just comparing. Men, women, based, uh, it's easier to gossip easier to be complaining and worry and then man is easy to have lust and adultery and have lack of sense of responsibility for the family all these are habits and some people say it's hard for me to get rid of this habit uh, when I look at a woman it's very hard to not to look at a woman I, it's hard not to lust now we must realize that it would destroy our life so if for any man if we are in any kind of lust, it would destroy our life. We have to say no to the lust and say, my life is very precious. If I let sin come into my life, it would destroy my life more and more. So we have to be careful using the five steps to victory. Aware of the sin, of the lust, and then it's destructive. Third, and then third, the Bible, what does the Bible say? And then pray for forgiveness and for strength. Number five, I choose to obey. I choose to turn away from lust. I choose to have a have, uh, holy thoughts in my life and then for women who like to gossip and then they will say okay i realize that i'm aware that i'm gossiping i'm aware that i'm having negative thoughts about people and then or emotional and then i realize this this destructive and then the bible tells us not to gossip and to help the person and pray for the people even though they are problem we want to pray for them and bless them and then pray for forgiveness and and strength and then I choose not to gossip even when we're gossiping we stop <clears throat> right away 
<coughs> when we are complaining, we want to stop right away. So these are choosing to obey God and breaking sinful habits. Very important. Breaking sinful habits. Okay, uh, next question. What is the first step of victory over sin that we have committed? The first step to victory is repentance and asking for forgiveness and trusting in Jesus' forgiveness. If we don't trust in Jesus' forgiveness and we say, I've committed a serious sin, God will not forgive me, I have no chance, then He will destroy His own chance. But if we believe God is a God to forgive, Jesus has died for all the sins in the world, except the Bible says that the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Now, if someone has committed the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, he would not have a sense of repentance because the Holy Spirit has left him already. So many people say, have I committed that sin? And I would say, if you still are sorry for your sins, then you have not committed that sin yet. You still have a chance. But we really don't want to say anything against the Holy Spirit. So we, we want to be very careful and not to let sin control our life and then take away our eternal life. So, and we believe that Jesus forgive me. Jesus forgive me. I'm forgiven. So I have a strength. So the love and the acceptance and the forgiveness give us continual strength to continue to live as a Christian. Okay, explain the five steps of victory. Uh, I just explained that already. Aware of the sin and it's destructive. And what does the Bible say to obey and pray for forgiveness and, and strength and then choose to obey, choose to stop the sin. And sometimes we need help from other Christians uh, so that we can face the sins together. Some Christians, they are very weak. They need to have Christian friends who are supportive, not Christian friends who gossip, but Christian friends who can pray together and encourage him and appreciate him together. Not just tell him what to do, but to appreciate his growth, appreciate his effort. That way he will have more strength. We need strength from other Christians to hold this person together. And then the next question, how can we stop a sin when it enters our mind? Now the key to stopping sin is to stop it when it comes to my mind. When we have a thought of lust, immediately say, this is destructive. I need to stop it and pray for forgiveness and ask God to give me strength to turn away from the woman and stop right away. And if a sin of wanting to tell a lie, we immediately will say, this, will, uh, uh, this is destructive. I don't want to tell a lie. Uh, and God doesn't like it and it can destroy the trust of people and it will destroy God's plan in my life. So I choose to stop it when, some, when I'm about to tell a lie, I want to stop it. So when we are in the habit of doing that, then gradually, immediately when a sinful thought comes into our heart, immediately we, we will stop it. We have the motivation to stop it. Uh, or when someone is complaining and very, very uh, sad and depressed, then we say, still, it's a sin. Depression is a sin. When we let depression affect us, we, then we're aware that we are unhappy, we're uh, depressed, and then it's destructive. And the Bible says, rejoice in the Lord always. And then, number four, that uh, we pray for forgiveness and for strength. And we praise God. Sometimes it's just asking for strength. But we praise God. Hallelujah. God is helping me. God is forgiving me. God is giving me strength so that I can have more joy. Hallelujah. So we praise God. We have more strength. And then we choose to overcome, say no to, to depression. Now, depression is not easy to overcome because sometimes even when we want to be joyful, the mind is used to being sad. So we need to keep praising God, maybe dance and, and uh, jump around and praise God. And then we can enjoy God and then be forgiven. And then, uh, and then we can have, have uh, joy, overcome the negative emotions. Okay, Num nine, the ninth uh, question, if we stop sinning while the sin is in our mind, what should we say to ourselves? We should say, well, you're doing well. You are obeying God. That's wonderful. You will do better and better. So we always want to encourage us when we are improving. Thank God I'm improving. It's not pride. It's saying, I thank God that He's helping me, that He's doing this. Okay, now the next lesson, the sixth one, help people to experience the Holy Spirit. Now first experience how we explain how we experience the Holy Spirit with these verses. These verses will tell us that we can experience the Holy Spirit in different ways. 
in John 14 27 peace I leave with you my peace I give to you so here first is Jesus said he will give us peace but some people say that's Jesus giving not the Holy Spirit giving but Father Son and Holy Spirit is triune God is three in one so when Jesus is giving the Holy Spirit is also giving us peace many people experience the Holy Spirit when they pray to God the first thing they experience is peace when they love God when they are praising God together when someone uh, spirit feel lay hand on them that they experience the peace coming to them the second is burdens removed Matthew 11 that come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden and I'll give you rest so they feel burden go away and third body in rest and comfort Psalm 16 9 therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices and my flesh also will rest in hope so it will give us joy and also the body the whole body will have greater comfort and even healing that will feel like floating in heaven when we praise God for a long time we can experience this peace coming to our body that we feel very uh, uh, in rest and in comfort and then love we can experience the love of God because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has given who was given to us that's Romans 5 5 so the Holy Spirit can give us love of God I have experienced that many times when I think of the love of God. Hallelujah! <laughs> and His love will flow into me. And the more open you are to God, the more you experience His love coming to you. So we need to, be fam need to familiarize ourselves with these verses that we can experience the Holy Spirit in different ways. In a healing, He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted so that the, heal the brokenhearted can be healed, that He can do inner healing in our life that uh, all the sadness in the past all the hurt feelings in the past can be healed and then physical healing that um, that Isaiah 53 5 by his stripes we are healed of the body uh, and Matthew quote this verse and said that is when he uh, Jesus gave healing of the body so this verse talk about healing of the body that people can have healing and I pray for many people and many people have experienced healing and then G is demons being driven out Mark 16 17 in my name they will cast out demons so in Jesus name we can cast out demons so these are ways we can experience the Holy Spirit and then when we pray for people in in the future lay hand on them and then experience any of this and then we can tell them this is what God is doing in your life you're experiencing God so God is blessing you do you want him to continue bless you and then if you want to trust in Jesus as a Savior and then you can be blessed by God in in your whole life so first we need to familiarize ourselves with this uh, work of the Holy Spirit and then second is Acts 1 8 for you have received power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and sh you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Jer Samaria and to the end of the earth what is the main purpose that God gives us the power of the Holy Spirit? Uh, this verse says very clearly, the main purpose when we receive the power of the Holy Spirit is to be His witnesses to in Jerusalem to the end of the world. So it's mainly for evangelism and for raising up the spiritual life of people because the Great Commission has two parts, bringing people to be disciples and then teaching them to obey everything Jesus has uh, taught us. So the main purpose is not just for our enjoyment. It's not just for healing. It's mainly for evangelism, saving people's life, and raising up people's life. Healing is for the purpose of bringing people to Jesus and also helping them to love God more, to obey God. So it's also for the Great Commission. The Great Commission is our final goal. It's very important. Now some people just want prophetic words just for themselves for comfort we want that for the Great Commission prophetic words and uh, healing and inner healing and all the work of the Holy Spirit we want it to be for uh, the Great Commission and then Acts 2 17 and it shall come to pass in the last day says God I will pour out on my spirit on all flesh your sons and daughters shall prophesy your young men shall see visions your old men shall dream dreams so God the question is how many Christians does God want to fill with the Holy Spirit what will the infilling of the Holy Spirit bring the 
God wants all flesh. Of course, it means all Christians because only Christians can have the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And God wants everyone in the whole world to believe in Jesus and have the infilling of the Holy Spirit. But not everyone obey and trust in Jesus and follow God. That's why they don't have it. But at least Christians, all Christians should have it. But it's very sad that many Christians do not understand the work of the Holy Spirit. And then they, uh, they're not open to the work of the Holy Spirit. At the same time, I want to say this. Among the charismatic Christians, there are some practices that are not from the Bible. For instance, some charismatic preachers don't preach much about the Word of God. They just quote the verse and then say a few sentences and then they keep going about experiences. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches to, you know, that we open the Word of God to teach people the Word of God, to teach them to obey the Word of God. Uh, and also there are some teachings that are not from the Bible. So we want to follow the Bible. Now you notice here I talk about the Holy Spirit. I talk about only what the Bible says that we can do and then I do. So here what does the Bible say that we can do? That God wants us to be able to prophesy and see visions and dream dreams. Now not everyone can prophesy. Not everyone see visions. Not everyone dream dreams. But we can all hear from God because Jesus said, my, my sheep will hear my voice. We all can hear. So we can, in a sense, we receive messages from God. Now some people say, I, don't, I haven't received any message from God. I want to say this. All Christians must have received messages from God. First, the message of repentance. All Christians, when they sin, they will receive the message of repentance from God. That the God tell them to to repent of their sins. Pay attention to that feeling when God speaks to us when we sin. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. And also when we read the Bible or, or hear message, God will also speak to our heart. And then we pay attention to how God speaks to us. And sometimes God guides us to do certain things for God. And we pay attention to that. Then we get used to hearing God's voice. And then gradually we can hear Him more and more. And some people will see visions, some people would have dreams, and then some people would prophesy, but we don't push it beyond what God has done. Don't force prophecy to come out if it hasn't come to us. Uh, but when we can confirm it, when we confirm it uh, with prayer, with different Christians praying together, and with pastor, uh, approving that this is from God, then we can say it out. So we have to be very careful with prophecy. I've heard many people, they prophesy and it didn't come true. So we want to uh, have the approval of pastors, leaders who are spiritual to find out if the prophecy came from God. Okay, now this next is about Mark 16, 15 on. Go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature and then he and these signs will follow those who believe. My, in my name they will cast out demons and they will speak with new tongues and they will take up serpents and if they drink anything deadly it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hand on the sick and they will recover. Now I, I believe that drink poison and, and not be hurt and lay hand on the uh, and take up serpents and not be hurt that this would apply to situation in difficult situation, not daily, excuse me, that, um, that is not, you know, I don't believe that we should go and touch a snake and try it out. I, I think this is for a situation when we are persecuted and then we have to face the snakes. But then to drive out demons and to uh, lay hand on the sick, this is what we should do. And who should do it? The Bible says this sign will follow those who believe. So everyone who believes can do it. But we have to clear ourselves of sins, negative thoughts, and demons. If people have demons or negative thoughts, live in that negative thoughts. Now people, we, we all still have negative thoughts, but then it will come and then we'll take care of it right away. But peop, some people stay in negative thoughts, then they should not lay hands on people. Some people stay in negative emotions, they should not lay hands on people. Some people stay in sin, they should not take... I lay hand on people. But if they have sinful thought, immediately they take care of it. And for the whole day, you know, as much as possible, they praise God and love God. And they 
uh, have a good relationship with God and they don't detect any demons and the pastor didn't detect any demons, then with the approval of pastor, they can lay hand on people and help them to experience the Holy Spirit and lay hand on the sick and be healed. And also it will bring uh, evangelism too. So what, does, what did Jesus promise to everyone who believe? How long will Christians have the authority to perform miracles in Jesus' name? So what did Jesus promise to everyone who believe? That we can drive out demons in Jesus' name, that we can have uh, miracles for following us, we can lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So we have these promises of miracles. How long will, this, will Christians have this authority? It says in verse 15, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So as long as the gospel is being preached, as long as there is uh, time to preach the gospel, then there can be miracles. But there are some people who have this uh, theology of termination of, uh, of miracles. But first, Mark 16 doesn't say it will terminate. And also, uh, 1 Corinthians 12 says that we still have this. It didn't say that we'll stop these spiritual gifts. Okay, now this next question here is 1 Corinthians 12, 8. It talks about different spiritual gifts, words of wisdom, uh, words of knowledge, and faith, and gifts of healing, and work miracles, and prophecy, and uh, discerning of spirit, and different kinds of tongues, and interpretation of tongue. Do these spiritual gifts include su supernatural gifts? So a number of these are supernatural gifts. Actually, all gifts are supernatural. But to many people, like playing the piano, they don't regard it as supernatural, but it's still supernatural, that God can give a supernatural ability to play the piano. But here, talk about gifts people regard as more supernatural, like uh, healing and, and prophecy. Uh, so these are more supernatural. And, and uh, uh, so this... So uh, the Holy Spirit does bring supernatural gifts. So what are the purpose of the supernatural gifts? The purpose is found in Mark 16 verse 20. It's to, for the confirmation of the Word of God. It's for confirmation of the Word of God so that people know that the Word of God is true so they believe and follow God's Word. Did Paul say that one day these gifts will disappear on earth? No, the Bible did not say that. The Bible did not say that this gift will stop. He did not say that at all. Okay, and what does the infilling of the Holy Spirit mean? Uh, to me, and from the Bible, it means a close relationship with God. Now, these people who are filled with the Holy Spirit, they really love God, they obey God, they dedicate their life to God, they, they forsake their sin, and they, and they go around and preach the gospel and help people. So, infilling the Holy Spirit is not just falling down under the Holy Spirit. It's a continual lifestyle, a close relationship with God and forsaking sin and obeying God and serving God in different ways. Now, we don't have to be ministers to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Any Christian can be filled with the Holy Spirit. But it must include that willingness to share the gospel and to tell people about Jesus and forsake all sins and obey God. And then who can lay hand on other people? How should people prepare themselves before they lay hand on people? What is the purpose of laying hand on people? And what should we pay attention to when we lay hand on people? Uh, according to Mark uh, 16, all who believe can lay hand on people. And how should people prepare themselves before they lay hand on people? They should have a close relationship with God and forsake all sins and repent and turn away from the sin and take care of the emotions, negative emotions, so that they don't live in negative emotions, negative thoughts or sins. And they don't live in unforgiveness. They want to take care of uh, unforgiveness and bad relationship with people. They want to bless people. So these are things we need to prepare. And also pray more for a stronger infilling of the Holy Spirit. And then the purpose. The purpose is to help people to experience the Holy Spirit, experience peace, love, joy, and the inner healing, and a transformation of life, and for uh, power to evangelism, for strengthening of the spiritual life, and renewal of the spiritual life, and for spiritual gifts. So the laying of hands will bring all the work of the Holy Spirit, and can bring a stronger relationship with God, and a stronger spiritual gifts. But it doesn't just come from laying on of hands. The person has, has to continue to keep the relationship with God. The person must continue to keep the relationship with God. He cannot just 
depend on someone laying hands on him and, and believe that and then think that he will re uh, receive the, the infilling of the Holy Spirit. It has to depend, he has to have a continual relationship with God. Okay? What should we pay attention to when we lay hands on people? First, we don't push people. I've seen many people, even, including evangelists, they push people to fall down. The Bible never says that. The Bible says that when John saw Jesus in Acts 1.17, he fell down under the power of God. He fell down. And then Saul, when he saw Jesus, he fell down. And the soldiers, when Jesus said, I am, and then they fell back. But nobody pushed them. Put, falling down is not what benefit them. It's what they experience the work of the Holy Spirit. So it doesn't matter if they don't fall, they're standing, it's fine. If they experience the peace, love, and joy, and healing, and transformation of their life, that's great, that's great already. They don't have to fall down. And many people push people to fall down for the sake of showing that they have the power of God. But actually, people see a mixed message. They can see the hand pushing. You know, sometimes they push on people, and then people uh, fall back a little bit, they push more, push more. You can see the head, the neck is bent. The person keep pushing, 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 until the person has no choice but to fall down. People can see that. It, they will give a mixed message. And people say, why did he do that? He did it for his own pride. So he's serving under pride. So I, I will advise people not to invite people, push people when they lay hands on people to the church. Don't ask them to come because they have us. They are controlled by pride and they don't know it. So they shouldn't lay hands on people at all. And, and people do it for their own pride, or for their own reputation or for money. Now it's right that ministers should receive money to support him, but he doesn't force it on people. And also when we lay hands on people, we want to touch just lightly. Don't put weights because then people will feel heaviness. Just touch lightly. And to be, uh, to, with women, uh, to be very careful. If there are women present, let the women lay hands on the women. Now if you're a pastor, you have to lay hands on men and women, then be, have clean thoughts. Don't have lustful thoughts. And be careful not to touch you know, sensitive parts of the body, just touch the shoulder or the head and don't touch other parts of the body and don't lay hand in secret. Do it in public and be careful. And catchers too, be careful. And it's better to have women catch the women and have men catch the men. Uh, so to be, uh, so that people don't have lust when they catch, or no man catch a woman that he has lust then then they are allowing sin to happen in the process of praying for people. Okay, eight. Should we push people to fall down when we <clears throat> lay on people? Definitely no. And then I would not invite someone who lay, push people to fall down. Why do so many push people when they lay on people? I think they do it because of pride. They want to do it for their own glory. That's something God doesn't like. If God works, we don't have to push. Number nine, what benefit can laying on hands bring? I just said it already, that then of joy, the joy of the Lord, peace, love, uh, uh, and uh, inner healing, physical healing, and uh, dem demons driven out, a transformation of life, uh, all kinds of work of the Holy Spirit that laying on hand can bring. How should people maintain the infilling of the Holy Spirit? Now, uh, we have talk about that before that uh, th that first we need to repent of our sins because God doesn't like sin first uh, and then second believe in the Bible and obey the Bible really follow the Bible and number three uh, to have faith in God trust that God really wants to fill us with the Holy Spirit so when we pray don't say oh God where are you but believe that he is blessing us and number four, spend long time hungering for God, praising God, loving God, and believing that God is loving us. And number five, obey God in every way, especially the Great Commission. And then number six, uh, 
take care of different sins or negative thoughts, negative emotions in our life. And seven, laying on of hands and spirit-filled prayer meeting are helpful. But they're not the only way. They are helpful. They helps us. We need to maintain that. So try to praise God and love God all day long. Then it's easier to keep the infilling of the Holy Spirit all day long.